UFC Fight Night Vegas 79, Fiziev versus Gamrot just took place and I'm going to go through the entire card, starting with the early prelims, ending with the main events, giving my reaction and breakdown to every single fight on the card and my overall event recap as well. Let's start straight away with the early prelim opener of Tamir Vidal versus Montserrat Rendon. Now, Montserrat Rendon outstruck Tamir Vidal. Well, not really outstruck her, but went tit for tat with her on the feet. But the main reason she won this fight was because she kept catching the kicks of Tamir Vidal, landing punches as she would go for them, knocking her off balance down to the canvas and spending a lot of the end of these rounds on top position, landing total strikes. A highlight from this one, there wasn't really much going on in this. I mean, maybe uh, Tamir Vidal went for a leg lock at one moment that Montserrat Rendon escaped. Um, I didn't pick this one correctly, by the way. Um, but still, uh, Montserrat Rendon punched Tamir Vidal in the boob. And then the referee was like, whoa, whoa. And Tamir like signaled to the referee, like, she just punched me in the chest. Which is like, not according to the rules whatsoever. So... Why did the referee step in there? And the same referee had another moment later on, which we'll talk about. But even still, really weird that they would, like, call a stop to the action from a boob punch. We've seen so many of them in women's MMA. That's not a reason to stop the action. So I thought that was a weird situation. But either way, Montserrat Rendon won the fight by decision by outpointing Tamir Vidal. We move on to the next fight on the early prelims that was Mizuke in UA. Versus Hannah Goldie. Not much to talk about here. This was an absolute snooze. Absolute snooze fest of Mizuki and UA. Stuffing the takedowns of Hannah Goldie. Beating her on the feet. Minorly, should I say. In like rounds one and three. And just being a little bit busier than her in the clinch, I guess. She got her own takedown. And was a lot more effective with her takedowns. So I guess that's like a positive for her in that regard. Um... Hannah Goldie can't wrestle and was trying to wrestle the entire time. Couldn't secure a single takedown. It is what it is. You know, that's just kind of how it goes sometimes. We move on to another fight that was on the card, which was Mo Usman versus Jake Collier. Mo Usman gonna Mo Usman, I feel like we need to start saying. But this was a little bit more on the feet than anticipated. Round three, Mo Usman wins it by, I believe, getting a takedown, staying on top position, landing total strikes. Round two was a very close round. Um, honestly, a very close round. I, I thought round one could go to Jake Collier, unless I'm missing something. I wasn't really paying full attention to this one. I was loading up my stream as it was happening. But Collier had some decent shots in round one. I thought Collier could win round one, and then Usman can win the second and third. Really uneventful fight. It was decent in terms of like more stand-up than we're normally uh, used to seeing from Mo Usman. But again, at the end of the day, it just comes down to this. You're a morbidly obese, obese man. You're a pig. Why are you fighting in the UFC heavyweight division? You're not taking your career seriously. End of story. Mo Usman wins by being in shape for a fight as a UFC heavyweight. This is what it comes down to a lot of the time. Like, I guess Collier thought he was going to get a quick KO and that's why he showed up in abysmal shape yet again. Either way, though, good job to Jake Collier. Uh, good job to Mo Usman. It wasn't as bad as his other ones, but that's a really low margin that Mo Usman has to beat, to be honest with you, because anything is not as bad as some of his other fights that he's had. So, good win. He wins, and he's now putting together a bit of a streak, so good for him. We move on. Up the card, Jacob Malkoon versus Cody Brandage. This was a sad one, because I'm going to tell you this right now. Cody Brundage might be the worst middleweight on the roster. I know he beat Trayshawn Gore, so I guess you can put Trayshawn Gore below him. He is absolutely awful. Like, he is absolutely terrible. He got to take... Terrible. He got a takedown at one point. Malkoon got right back up. And then Malkoon got his own takedown. And on the feet, he was winning. But then on the takedown, he was just beating up on Cody Brundage. But was beating up on him illegally, is basically the story of this fight. He was beating up on Cody Brundage illegally, landing a few back of the head shots beforehand and then threw an elbow forearm shot that kind of landed behind the head as well. I don't know what that yellow mark is. It's really annoying me and I'm going to get that as soon as this is over. I've only just noticed it. Either way, now you won't be able to not see it for the rest of this video. Um, either way, I don't understand 
why are you throwing back? At, just be clean with the work. I know that sometimes they let fighters throw back at the headshots, but you aren't a big enough star for them to completely overlook back at the headshots. And everyone knows you're only allowed to throw back at the headshots when it's part of a finishing sequence. Now, Cody Brandage did absolutely milk it, but it was an illegal shot. So it is what it is. It's the game, you know. You're giving him the opportunity to absolutely milk it beyond belief because he knows he'll never get a win in the UFC unless it comes in that fashion. He was about to be dominated by Malkoon, but Malkoon just can't not hit him in the back of the head, apparently, which is just silly decision-making from him. He needs to pick his shots a little bit better. He kind of messed up his own career. He's now 7-3, and three, even though I think he's one of the better middleweights. I mean, he took Brendan Allen to a very close decision that in another world, the judges could have given him. So... I think Malkoon really, really messed up there. Going to suck for him. I'm sure he's going to be kicking himself about that. And Brundage gets to prolong his inevitably soon-to-end career because he is actually awful. We move on. Up the card. Tim Means versus Andre Fialho. I told you Tim Means would get it done. That dude's a dog. What a performance by Tim Means. Gets the third round TKO. And it was a really good performance. Basically, what happened was Andre Fialho started and I was like, oh, God. Maybe I'm going to be wrong on this one because Andre Fialho is actually starting to look pretty switched on early here. And Tim Means looks a little bit slow. But then Tim Means times him with a knee up the middle as he's rushing in. Drops him badly. Lands some elbows of ground and pound. They end up tied, on the gr tied up on the ground for quite a bit. Up against a cage. Means is landing some shots as well. Go into the, some shots in the pocket. But every time Means would try and unload, Fialho would start landing some shots back as well. And basically, the story of this fight was, after that first round when uh, Means knocked him down, was Andre Fialho can't take shots the same way these other guys can. He's a powerful dude. He's a dangerous dude. But when he gets hit on the chin, he wobbles. And that was the story of this fight. They both would land good shots on each other. And Fialho even had a moment where it looked like Means was in trouble. But Means would land like a glancing shot or a head kick that's partially blocked. And Fialho would just go and start wobbling all over the place. And that was the story of the fight. Means would constantly get momentum shifts in his way. Because Andre Fialho is just not UFC chin caliber, sadly enough for him. And I feel really bad for him. Unfortunate. His career is now probably done. That's four losses in a row by KO as well, which is extra bad. You know, I mean, four losses is one thing, um, but four in a row by KO. Lost to Buckley by KO. Lost to Means by KO. Lost to Matthews by KO. Uh, Muslim Salikov by KO. So it's not looking good for Andre Fialho. I reckon he's going to get cut from the UFC. But he was active and he probably made a bunch of money even losing anyway. But yeah, Tim Means smoked him. In the third round, landed a good combination, beating him up against a cage, going to the body with knees and punches, eventually folding Fialho up against a cage, dropping him and finishing him off. Amazing performance by Tim Means. He gets the job done. We move on. Up the card. Dan Argetta versus Miles Johns. I picked Dan Argetta to win. I thought he'd be too big, too physical, be able to outgrapple Miles Johns and be too much of a bully on the feet. But story of this fight was... Round one is like a close round, but I leant towards Argetta because I didn't think Johns was landing anything too crazy. And uh, Argetta looked like he had him with a knee at one point at the end of round one. And he had the takedown and a rear naked choke attempt. Wasn't quite in, but it was over the face. It was like a, a ish choke attempt that he was fighting for for about three minutes. And um, Argetta failed that choke. Johns did land some good shots in that round. Close round to score. I gave it to Argetta live. Last two rounds, though, undeniable to Miles Johns, winning those rounds on damage. Argetta was just basically failing takedowns on him, getting taken down in moments as well, um, but just not really landing when he needed to. And the end, of the end of the day is this. Dan Argetta cannot strike whatsoever, has no technical ability in a striking, and that's what it comes down to. Maybe he injured himself in round one, he did look like he buckled on his leg at one moment. So it was like, okay, maybe there's a bit of an injury here. And that's why he looked so weird. But it was just Johns being able to throw punches. And Dan Argetta walking forward with no setups whatsoever. Just swinging reckless overhands over and over again. And getting exposed for it. So really good job by Miles Johns. Gets the job done. Decent performance. We move on. Ricardo Ramos versus Charles Jordan. Charles Jordan gets it done. 
Charles Jordan gets it done with a guillotine in the first round, an arm in guillotine as well. At one moment, he nearly had his signature one arm guillotine that he pulled off against Lando Venata, where it's like locked in and all he has to do is put a little bit of pressure and it's done. Um, but Ricardo Ramos ended up rolling over the top, getting out of the position, um, switching it, ending up in side control on top of Jordan. Jordan kept that guillotine position the entire time he was on the ground. And I was, like, worried for him. Like, dude, let it go. Try and use this to get back up. He was doing a good job of keeping his legs in between the hips of Ramos and him. So keeping that distance between the two of their hips. So Ramos couldn't settle on top position or look to pass over. Kept getting his legs in the way. Kept creating space. Did a good job. And then when he actually, when he scrambled to get back up to his feet and locked in an arm in guillotine, I was like, please don't pull this guillotine. You're not going to get it. Just get back up. Because I was worried, like, oh, my God. He's just got out from bottom position, and he's put himself back on bottom position. But this one was really tight, mainly because he stopped Ramos' ability to roll over the top, and Ramos was so nearly out of it. I actually thought he was going to get out of it, but he was so nearly out of it. And when you're so nearly out of it, and it's just at the top of the back of your head, in the bicep, that is... That's when it's the tightest. It reminded me of uh, Davison Figueredo versus Alex Perez. He looked like at any moment he could have popped his head out. But in that moment, that's when the guillotine's the tightest. Because you've got that full leverage. So Charles Jordan gets an arming guillotine in round one. Good performance. Good finish. I assume he's going to get a performance bonus for that. I imagine the performance bonuses are going to go straight to him, Brian Battle, and Marina Rodriguez. I guess. Or maybe Tim Means will get one. To be honest with you, Tim Means deserves one. I don't think they'll give out fight of the night to Fialho, seeing as they're going to cut him. They're not going to pay someone that they're going to cut. What a weak card this was, to be honest with you. But yeah, I imagine he's going to get a performance bonus. So 50k for Jordan on a night where normally he might not have gotten that. So good for him. We move on to the second fight on the main card. Brian Battle versus AJ Fletcher. I picked Brian Battle to win. He gets it done. AJ Fletcher... Actually had a decent moment in round one, to be fair. Brian Battle was constantly attacking the body with front kicks at range. That's mainly the only thing he had success with for the entire fight, was just front kicking the body of AJ Fletcher and teeping the body of AJ Fletcher. And you could see the body of AJ Fletcher reddening up, not just because he's pale as a ghost, but because he was getting some big teeps and front kicks to the body. Um, but then towards the end of round one, where I thought that maybe Brian Battle was outpointing AJ Fletcher, Fletcher lands an elbow on the break from a clinch, and it's just like, oh, well, there you go. Round to AJ Fletcher. Um, they didn't even give him a knockdown for that, but it basically was a knockdown. He won the round one because of that elbow that he landed that rocked Brian Battle to the canvas, and that took away the round for Brian Battle, even though he was doing some good work. Round two... Fletcher tried to force the grappling a bit more up against the cage. And I'm not joking you. Battle landed about 16, 15 knees to the body. Over and over and over again. Fletcher had no answer for them. Battle was just too tall for him. You're 5'8", basically. You're 5'9", 60-something inch reach. What are you doing at welterweight, bro? You've got to be a weight bully and a frame bully these days. You ain't Volk, little bro. That's all I've got to say about that. You get a knee in the clinch. Can't take him down. And eventually, he just started to fold. Battle started to get his own takedown. Ended up on top position and secured the rear naked choke over AJ Fletcher. Really good performance by Brian Battle. Really surgical. And again, probably earned himself a performance of the night bonus. We move on. Up the card to another fight, which was Marina Rodriguez versus Michelle Watterson Gomez. I went with Marina Rodriguez here, of course. She won the last fight and dominated, and it was absolute domination. Now, I was worried at the start that Michelle Watson Gomez was going to work a wrestling clinic on her because she immediately got a takedown, and the Buddha was looking good. Um, but she immediately got a takedown, ended up on top position of Marina Rodriguez, um, but then Marina worked her way back up, and then in the clinch was the entire fight. That was the entire winning of the fight for Marina Rodriguez. She got in the clinch, Need the body of Michelle Waterson over and over again. Like, I mean, there were so many of them. Knee to the body, knee to the body, elbow to the head, knee to the body, cut open Michelle Waterson with an elbow, more knees to the body that looked like they hurt Michelle Waterson as well, and then just followed her down as Michelle Waterson cowered away from Marina Rodriguez and failed takedown attempts and beat her up badly. I thought the referee was going to step in about five different times in round one. About five different times in round one, I thought the referee's going to... Okay, that's enough. She's being beaten up. It's clearly on its way to a 10-7 round ref. Because I was thinking to myself, like, the referee stopped Marina Rodriguez versus Amanda Lemos because 
Rodriguez got rocked and then took two shots up against a cage whilst being fully conscious. They stopped that fight. So I was thinking, well, why aren't they stopping this one? Michelle Waterson's getting destroyed. They're going to stop it at any moment. Hurt to the body, hurt to the head, got hurt to the body shot at the end of round one as well, but had to get back up. It was a tough fight to watch, and she brought her kids. Why are you bringing your kids? Think things through. You've already been dominated by this woman. You're only getting older. You're probably going to get dominated again. Why put your daughter through that? Terrible parenting from Michelle Waters and Gomez to bring her kid to that event. She was crying in the front row, apparently, according to some journalists that were tweeting about it. And uh, Marina Rodriguez gets a dominant win, folds Michelle up against a uh, cage in round two, pieces her up, and the referee's seen enough. No, she got a takedown, got full mount, landed a few follow-up shots. And I think the referee stepped in early for a full mount stoppage because... He realized that he kind of messed up in round one, not stopping that fight, basically. The ref had money on it in round two, I reckon. We move on. Up the card, Bryce Mitchell versus Dan Ige. This one was crazy. Now, I've given a gander at some of the rounds and some of the moments in the rounds because I can skip back on the feed, and I can't do that if I go off of the feed immediately afterwards. But um, Bryce Mitchell, very close fight is all I'm going to say. I think there's a world where you kind of do give this to Dan Ige. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I know Bryce Mitchell had moments of control in the fight where he got his takedown. And at the end of round one, he's got mount. But he wasn't doing much with that position. Now, he did look like he was going for stuff at the end of round one. But not much of it landed. And I was thinking, okay, it's not. It's looking good for the judges. Maybe they can give it to him. But Ige's cut him under the eye in that round. So I reckon round one's going to Ige. Very close, though, could have gone to Bryce Mitchell, I guess. Whatever. Weird one, right? Because Ige was, like, noticeably hurting him with shots. Round two, Mitchell gets a takedown and an arm triangle attempt at the end of the round. But Ige, before that, is, like, doing good on the feet. Like, he landed a couple good shots, hurt Bryce Mitchell to the eye in round three, swole up his eye completely shut nearly, cut him over the top of his eye. I mean, Mitchell's eye was an absolute mess in that round two absolute mess caused by Ige and when Ige landed it Mitchell winced it and started like panic shooting and trying to get himself back into the fight so I thought okay on damage Ige might have won the first two rounds could have been 1-1 one, one, though could have been 1-1 one, one. round three of course Bryce Mitchell gets it done Ige landed no significant strikes I think a lot of this fight though was a misunderstanding of the scoring between the two of them I'm gonna get to what Mitchell did in a second damage you're in top position 10 seconds left on the clock. Rain down some ground and pound here. You know what I mean? Stop trying to keep positional control here and not let the guy get back up. Get some damage off. Now, I don't mind giving a decision to Mitchell. Um, I do think Ige won it live, edging his way for the first two rounds because of the visible damage on Mitchell's face compared to none on Ige's face. But let's get to it. Bryce Mitchell enters the cage walking out to North Men North of Rich, uh, Rich Men North of Richmond, which is based. Walks out to that. Surprised he didn't come out of a tinfoil hat. That's what the chat was saying. Um, walks out to that. Gets in the cage. Singing the lyrics of the song. Hyping himself up. He has a Bible with him. And as, as the guy is doing his announcement in the cage, Bryce Mitchell holds up the Bible at Dan Ige and screams freedom as loud as he possibly can. This guy's coming for everything Strickland's working for. Covington as well, crazy, holding up a Bible, screaming freedom, good to see, based from Bryce Mitchell, and the Lord was on his side, because he got that decision win, and one of them gave a 30-27 in round two, someone gave him round two, which is crazy, but either way, very close fight, I don't think it was a robbery in hindsight, but it was a close enough fight where you're like, I don't know who won, but I'm gonna lean Ige because of the damage on Mitchell's face right now, um, but Bryce Mitchell gets it done, and then the post-fight speech, Wholesome Mitchell talking about the Hawaii fires and how the, you know, Satan shall not separate us. And, you know, we got the power of the Lord on our side. And whilst we are together, nothing must separate us. Power of evil does that. And all this type of stuff. And he's trying to get uh, Dan Ige to pray with him and stuff. And he tells Bisping to let Dan Ige pray about the whole thing in Hawaii and stuff like that. He donates 5K to Hawaii. Good for him. But, um... 
Bisping takes away the mic, doesn't give Ige the chance to pray. But I think Ige was thankful for that because I don't know if he would have had anything to say. <laughs> I really think Ige didn't understand. I think Ige was so annoyed at losing that close decision and thought to himself, oh God, oh my God, what am I... I just looked on Ige's face and I saw a guy who didn't want to be there. He loved the Hawaii thing, I'm sure. But he didn't want the whole prayer stuff to go on. I think he was a bit uh, annoyed by that and just stuck in the moment of just being like, God, I just lost. Please, not right now. I don't have anything to pray about, dude. I just lost half my paycheck. You know what I mean? Um, but either way, wholesome moment, I guess. Weird moment. I was really weirded out by him asking Ige to pray because I saw Ige panic like, oh, don't put that mic in my face. I don't have anything. I can't. I don't have anything to say. I, I'm on the spot. You know what I mean? Um, but Mitchell wholesome and without him Ige would have ne wouldn't have even got to be in the post fight interview so one of the highlights of the card for sure good job Bryce Mitchell he gets it done in a very close decision based on in my opinion just visible doing good towards the end of the rounds is kind of how Mitchell won we move on just suppressed a burp there uh Rafael Fiziev versus Mateus Gamrot uh never get them my way these random fluke moments just never go my way, and it's absolutely sad. Um, Fiziev won round one, outstruck Mateus Gamrot. Gamrot might have landed like a few more glancing shots, but Fiziev landed all of the good shots in round one. Um, so I gave him round one. He had a good body shot, head shot combo at one point. He landed a good right hand on Gamrot, and Gamrot sort of like fell into a takedown afterwards. It landed behind his ear, and... Um, Fiziev showed great takedown defense. The balance that he showed in round one on one leg, maybe that's where the partial ACL moment might have happened. Who knows? Um, but he balanced really well on one leg, got out of the takedown, did good in round one, won round one in my books. Round two, he was doing good again. Gamrot hadn't yet landed a shot in round two. Went for the takedown, though. Didn't get the take. He got the takedown, but Fiziev worked his way back up, scrambled really well. He even had a moment where he scrambled really dynamically at the end of round one as well. And I had a little moment on the ground of like maybe Fiziev saying, I couldn't let you get that one like at the end of the round and stuff like that. So they had a wholesome moment there. Round two, Fiziev's doing tit tat shots, lands, I think, two shots or some shit like that. And then throws a kick at Gamrot's arm or body. It was a body kick attempt. And Gamrot, it hits Gamrot's elbow. And I think immediately, oh my God, he's broken his foot. He goes down immediately afterwards. But you could actually see his kneecap pop as he went for that kick. And I think he popped his knee out of place on his left leg as he went for that kick with his right leg. And then Gamrot just goes, follows up a few shots, wins the fights by TKO and says, yeah, let's go. It's like screaming like he just KO'd Oliveira or Makashev for the belt. But... I get it, Matt. I'm not going to go at Gamrot for celebrating like that. If Gamrot was flipping off Fiziev on the ground and, like, doing the belt signals at him as he's on the floor whining, then I'd understand why people would be upset. But at the end of the day, he's humble background, doing it for his family, needs a double paycheck. This is his chance to get back into that title elimination bout picture, now on a two-fight win streak. Let him have a little bit of a celebration. You know what I mean? I know that you've got to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, like Curtis Blades did to Tom Aspinall. Very, very good of Curtis Blades to do that for a similar situation. But um, Mateus Gamrot, man, has basically let him celebrate a little bit. You know, there's a lot that goes into these fight camps. He looked like he had staff infection. So that might be why he was so relieved to get the win as well, because he had all these bumps over his chest. And, uh, yeah, I think he might have had staff infection, so who knows? But, yeah, he wins based on a weird freak incident. Tough to watch. Really tough for Rafael Fiziev. Don't know what he's going to do next now. He's going to have to be out for quite some time. And Gamrot is back in the picture, I guess, after some performances that are weird back-to-back. -back. So we'll see what happens in his future as well. Like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Toodle pip. I'll see you later. I think I went, what? Let me check what I went on the card. I went 0-1, one, 1-1, one, 2-1, one, 2-2 one, two and one, two and two because of the DQ, even though Malcoon would have definitely won. 2-2, two, 3-2, two. Two, Tim Means underdog, 3-3 three, three on the prelims, 4-3 Jordan, 5-3 Battle, 6-3 Rodriguez, 7-3 Mitchell. I went 7-4. and four. Two freak incidents that cost me wins that I probably would have gotten if not for them. You know what I'm saying? So... Is it what it is? Still went positive despite some freak accidents that went against my picks. Seven and four. Like and subscribe. Toodle pip. See you later. Goodbye.